be back here in the middle of November for a weekend. So, woohoo! He's coming back from a trip to Taiwan and Korea with Peter. So Peter will be going with him as well. And so um, he's like an old friend who's, who's you know, we talk to uh, every time we get to Toronto, but we haven't had him out here for how many years? We can't even remember. It's probably a dozen or more since he's been, since he's been out this way, and, or, or at least in our church. And so we are delighted to have him here. He's going to be speaking here t t this morning, and as Pam said, in a public meeting uh, this evening. And then for the school, he'll be teaching tomorrow in the school, tomorrow night as well. So, Peter, why don't you come on up? Why don't we welcome Peter? Make him feel glad he showed up today. He, he also... He also has been, uh, we, we circulated him around our friends in uh, Victoria, Courtney, and Powell River. So this is the tail end of his swing through the West Coast. And so he's been encouraging and strengthening all our family out in those, in those areas. And so now he's here with us for the weekend. And so just receive from him what he has to share with us today. Amen. Thanks, Elf. Great to be with you guys, and good to be here in Abbotsford. <laughs> Woohoo! Yes, please. Oh, yeah. yes, please. <clears throat> this morning, I, I want to just talk about uh, receiving the Father's love. You know, as, as many of us who come from backgrounds where we did not have tender affection, from our fathers, from our mothers. From the beginning of our lives, fear sets in. And you know, they, they say that we are, we are born with two fears. Anybody know what they are? Fear of falling. Fear of falling. And the fear of loud noises. But there have been 7,000 fears recorded to this date. Wow. Fear grows. Yeah. And without love, fear sets in. I was born in Edmonton, Alberta. And when I was born, um, I had RH negative blood. And nobody knew about the RH factor except my doctor. And he had just come back from uh, a two-week seminar in New York. But what that meant was he saved my life, but I was in the hospital for the first six weeks. I was apart from my mother. And little did I know that that experience where I should have been just held and hugged and nursed and, and given that tender, affectionate love, fear set in. And we read in 1 John 4 that perfect love casts out half our fear. <laughs> How much? All our fear. And... <clears throat> So the important thing is to receive love, which, which collides with a fear that a lot of us have, and that is the fear of intimacy. And intimacy is into me you see. Because in order for me to receive love, I have to open my heart. I have to make myself known. I have to take the risk of rejection. And if you're anything like me, you know, being a hurting person in a hurting world, you've been betrayed once or twice or more. Where you opened your heart to someone and instead of, you know, developing that intimacy with them, you were rejected, you were used, you were manipulated and maybe said what I said, I'll never do that again. Mm, yeah. I will never take the risk of rejection again. And that's a vow. And we get locked into our vows. Uh, at 12 years old, I decided that after being disappointed by my father so many times, 
I decided that I didn't need a father. <laughs> and through, through a, a, a very disappointing experience, I declared in a rage that I, I don't need a father. I will never believe what, what a father says to me. Because my father was a workaholic and an alcoholic. And he would make promises, but he would never fulfill. And you know, Proverbs tells us that hope deferred makes your heart grow sick. And I had a pretty sick heart by the time I was 12. And when, you, when you're disappointed in the person that's supposed to love you the most, uh, the enemy just loves that. Yeah. And he jumps on that bandwagon. Yeah. And I began to grow in the fear of rejection. And that, that caused a deep wound and, and root in my life. <clears throat> I became a Christian in 1978. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Went to get baptized at a church, got filled with the Holy Spirit. And that, to me, was, was awesome. But Jesus came to bring us to the Father. He came to bring us into the relationship He has with the Father. And we haven't got time to go into this today, but if you read John 17, especially the last eight verses, you will see the heart of the Father, why Jesus came to earth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Destination, Father. So, so Jesus came into my life to restore me to the Father. And when you restore something, you make it just like it's never been broken. Hello? <laughs> just as if you had God your Father as your Father from day one. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you all the years the locusts have eaten. So whatever fear had eaten up in my life... I have the potential of being restored just as if I had God the Father. Perfect love from day one. No fear of intimacy. No fear of intimacy. If you're married, you know the challenge. You know the challenge of keeping your heart open to one another. When you have disagreements, when you see things differently, <clears throat> it's a challenge, isn't it? And what is the challenge? Father, not my will, thy will be done. It is really taking the cup, eating the, the cup of suffering, which is not my will. That's what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Father, if it is possible to take this cup from me, not my will, but thy will be done. And so, drinking that cup is something that each one of us need to do on a regular basis. If we want to increase in love. Amen? Amen. It's not giving in to what I think is right and trying to prove I'm right. It is surrender. We sang that song at the beginning of the service. It's all about surrender. This is where you experience the Father's love. Yeah. Where you are willing to meet Him on His terms, not on your terms. Where you're willing to let go of anything in order to receive His love. You know, <clears throat> I, I, even though I was a Christian, even though I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I still had a closed heart towards the Father. Based on the judgments I had made towards Him, based on my 12-year-old decision, I don't need a Father. And in my heart, different from the theology in my mind, in my heart, I was saying, you know, me and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we get along great. I don't need a Father. 
until five years after I became a Christian. Here I am sitting in a 10-week school with my wife learning about the Father's love. You know the only reason I was in that school? I wanted to become a better youth pastor. Because all these kids who were getting, getting saved were all messed up. And it was like the blind leading the blind. And when I went to this 10-week school, I gave up the best job that I ever had. And, and it was like the, the far extreme of my faith. I can take 10 weeks off. Well, God had a plan. And that plan was turned into seven years. <laughs> Slow learner. <laughs> but I remember in the seventh week of that school, after I had a revelation of the Father, where I had let go of my bitterness, my judgments, my vows towards my earthly father. See, when, when you let go, <laughs> you open yourself to receive. You can't receive like this. If you're not willing to forgive those in your past, if you're not willing to let them go, you can't receive. And I had, I had a deep, deep disappointment towards my father. And, and I felt justified. <laughs> you know, someone said forgiveness is like <clears throat> you drink the poison and expect the other person to die. I wanted revenge towards my father, even though he'd been dead for years. I felt like if I forgave him, I was letting him off the hook. I was saying what he did or didn't do was, was okay. That's the deception of the devil. And he just, he just, you know, had sown so many things into me just because I said, I don't need a father. But in that school, I was able to drink the cup. I was able to let go of my judgment and my, my disappointment towards my father. And as a result, I opened myself up to revelation of his heart towards me. I think one of, one of the saddest scriptures in the, in the Bible is in John 3.19 where, where the Father is saying to Israel, I would, have, I would have desired that you would call me Father. I would have desired that you would have called me Father. And yet you were unfaithful. Mm. You see, we're going to be unfaithful if we don't know the heart of the Father. Because yeah. this only works if we're ruined by love, not by fear. Yeah. Come on. It only works if we have passion. Yeah. Instead of, you know, being bound by the fear of failure, the fear of rejection. Incredible thing that fear can control a person's life. We're living in a society now that's trying to calm their fears. Yeah. And they think they can do it by, you know, pulling a, fi a big fish out from under. <laughs> you ever see that cow? What's the name of that show? Um, something fishing. And they pull these huge catfish by sticking their fist in the mouth of these catfish. This is supposed to overcome your fear. Really? <laughs> Only perfect love casts out fear. Only perfect love can enable you to really love with an open heart. Where you just don't have surface relationships, you actually have intimate relationships. You, you, are, you have the bond of the Spirit because it is heart to heart, not head to head. You and I have been looking for all our lives intimate relationship and yet <clears throat> people can come to church every Sunday and feel like they're alone and they blame the church for it no you see <laughs> it's not my will I have to open my heart I have to let go of those people who have disappointed me in the past betrayed my trust so that I can connect with those around me we haven't met one another before, most of us, but we're family. Yeah. 
But the sad thing is we could, we could be in the same church and live like orphans. Yeah. Have no connection. Feel all alone. Or we could have lifelong relationship. Yeah. Where we're for one another, never against each other. Yeah. That we really, like the Holy Spirit, come alongside each other. Yeah. And help each other go farther than ourselves. Yeah. That's the heart of the Father. So... <clears throat> Don't let the devil deceive you that, you know, you aren't experiencing the Father's love because it's their fault. <laughs> Have you let go? So I was sitting in the school, and for the first three weeks, I said to my wife every day, I just want to go home. <laughs> See, I had been running from this pain since I was 12 years old. I tried to numb the pain. <laughs> I tried to forget the pain. I denied the pain. You know, grief, one of the stages of grief is denial. You just pretend you're fine, which is actually, I found out what fine means. It's freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm fine. How are you? Fine. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's okay to say you're fine as long as you really are fine. But living in denial, I'm fine. I don't have problems. You know? I just drink myself into oblivion or I, you know take drugs to numb the pain or whatever the, whatever the addiction is. Because where you have pain, you look for pleasure to kill it. Yeah. And pleasure becomes addiction. So <clears throat> I, got, I bought right into that. I, I spent, you know, the first uh, 14 years of my life killing the pain, drowning my sorrows. Whatever, whatever thing I could get my hands on to numb the pain, that's what I did. Thinking that I'm fine. Well, it's when the prodigal came to his senses, everything changed. It's when the prodigal realized that, you know, the way he thought life was supposed to go just ain't working. <laughs> The, the smart thing would to, to do would be to come home to the father. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, that younger brother, he thought he could work his way back into acceptance and love. But what he received from the father is what every one of us need to receive. Yeah. What did the father give him? He gave him his tender, affectionate love. Yeah. He kissed him. And the Greek is, he kept kissing him. Wow. He kissed his face off. <laughs> he hugged him. That's tender, affectionate love. Even though, you know, before I, I came to know the Father, I was addicted to pornography. I was addicted to sexual addiction. I was trying to kill the pain through pleasure. But at the same time, I had fear of intimacy. You know, that, that sexual addiction is just the counterfeit for the real thing. And the pleasures of sin just last for a moment. Um, and, but you become addicted to that. You, you're deceived into thinking, you know, as I learned in AA, insanity is doing the same thing again and again expecting a different result. Yeah. And, you know, the second step of the 12-step program is we admitted we were insane. <laughs> that God could restore us to sanity. Yeah. And so the same thing is, I need perfect love. Whether you know it or not, today, you were born to be delighted in by your Father. And I say delight because in the English language that's the closest word that comes to how he feels about us. Yeah. You know, I could say God loves you, but that's so generic, isn't it? Because I love my dog, I love my house, I love my car, I love my job, whatever. 
But delight puts it in a whole new level. That the Father, when he looks at me, delights in me just as I am, not as I should be. And here's the truth. You're never going to be what you should be until you get to heaven. So I need to receive the delight of my Father just as I am with my struggles, with my spots and wrinkles, with the stuff that still isn't, you know, yet sanctified. I need to receive that love so I can love myself. And man, if you don't love yourself, God help your neighbor. <laughs> you can't actually love God unless you love yourself. And unfortunately, most Christians don't love themselves. They don't like what they see in the mirror. Because all, all of us have been schooled in shame. We have been schooled to feel we're not good enough. And man, when somebody comes around who's better than us, we feel it. Yeah. We feel we're not good enough. Their sun darkens my day. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm sitting in the school and all this stuff is coming to the surface. And I think I'm just a youth pastor who's there to get equipped to help other people. <laughs> You cannot give what you have not first received. You can give theology, you can give uh, understanding, but it's your personal revelation that gives you faith. And I had a revelation of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, but not of the Father. Because I was still blocked in my relationship with Abba Father based on my judgment towards my earthly father. So sitting in that school, I had a choice to make. And every day, as I said, I, want, I told my wife, I've had enough. Let's go home. We're 600 miles from home. <laughs> we, I quit my job. We rented our house. I mean, we, we just put everything on hold to go to this school. And in the third week of that school, I was able to forgive my father. I was able to have compassion on him instead of judgment. Yeah. And you know why I was able to have compassion on him? Because God, my father, showed me his heart for my father. You know, he has compassion on your ruins. Wow. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Hello? Psalm 103? Yeah. He is, he is gracious and compassionate. That means he knew why I felt the way I did towards my dad. See, when I yelled out at 12 years old, I don't need a father, God heard that. The devil heard that. And everybody in my house heard that. It was a rage. And actually a spirit of rage came into me at that time. And I used it as a weapon to scare people so they'd be afraid of me. So <clears throat> I'm sitting in the school, the youth pastor, <laughs> and the father sees me as a son. Yeah. And somebody's got to change and it ain't going to be him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you will change your mind, he will change your heart. Repentance is change your mind. Grace changes your heart. We got to believe the truth before we feel it. We've got to change our mind. That is not who I am. This is who I am. God can do all the stuff that needs to be done without us. He doesn't need us. He could just pour out his spirit and everybody, every knee bows, every tongue confesses. Game, set, match. We're all going to heaven. But he chooses to co-labor with us. But he doesn't want you to be a human doing. He doesn't want you to be a person who is serving him for approval. He wants you to live your life from approval. Yeah. In a rest of knowing that he has already done it all for me. 
My righteousness is not based on my works. It's all on his works. I am, his, I am the Father's beloved Son in whom he has great delight because of everything Jesus did for me, not what I do for him. And that in itself, it's like that takes a lifetime to unpack. You know, if you've been a person who's been raised to believe that you need to perform for value, you don't just change overnight. <laughs> That, that, I know in my own life that pops up again and again and again in different circumstances where I'm trying to prove my value and worth through what I do. And it's like, oh, back to center. <laughs> no, I am his beloved son based only on what he has done for me. Not what I do for him. If you want to sum up the spirit of this world, it would be this. I do, therefore I am. The more I do, the more I am. The less I do, the less I am. But in the kingdom of God, it, is, it, is, it could be summed up this way. He did, therefore I am. Yeah. He did, therefore I am. So do you feel good enough today? I think so. <laughs> Until somebody better than me comes along. <clears throat> you see that not feeling good enough is the result of fear. Yeah. I'm not good enough. Therefore I try harder and I give up. And I try harder again and I give up again. So I'm sitting in the school and all of a sudden, I begin to realize that I am, I am blocked from receiving the Father's love because of the judgment I have made on my Father. Wow. And also the judgment I've made on myself. That I saw myself, I don't need a father, therefore I am an orphan. Yeah. And it's incredible. I got involved in a gang before gangs were popular. <laughs> gangsters <laughs> and we my father was was very wealthy at the time but here I am breaking into houses just for the fun of it being a juvenile delinquent taking my pain out on innocent people yeah. so I, I'm sitting in that school I'm able to let my father go I'm able to open my heart to the father God and about four weeks later, I had a dream. And when I had that dream, I felt God commission me wow. that this was going to be my life message for the rest of my life. Wow. And in that dream, if you uh, want to hear the whole thing, it is on this CD, the purple and gold one, which is a dramatized version of this one, which is six hours long, Trusting God as Father. <clears throat> and if you need some more joy in your life, you need to get this one. <laughs> that was the Have Another Drink conference where every 5,000 people fall on the floor rolling and laughing. <laughs> First you get the pain out, then you have the joy. <laughs> and in this dream, I saw myself in a cabin. I, you know, this is how the dream started. I'm in a cabin that my father promised to take me to when I was 12 years old. And he had asked me what I wanted for my 12th birthday. And I said, all I want is time alone with you. Because that's what we used to have when, up until I was five years old, we had a cottage where we would go there frequently. And I would have my dad to myself. And then he got busy. And he, he thought success was out there somewhere. Anyway, <clears throat> he was kind of shocked that all I wanted for my 12th birthday was time with him alone. The night before we're supposed to go on this trip, it was actually up to the Rockies in Hinton, Alberta. And <clears throat> the night before, 
I go into his office before, you know, I go to bed. And I said to my dad, Dad, you're not packed. We're leaving at 6 a.m. And he's talking to a client on the phone. And he said, son, I, I can't go tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Oh, no, I can't go. And he just goes back to talking to this person on the phone. Little did he know, that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I had decided that I was going to give him one more chance. And because he disappointed me, that's it. So I went from his office into my bedroom and I shouted at the top of my lungs, I hate you. I don't need a father. I will never believe anything you say. The devil heard it. God heard it. My family heard it. And from that point on, I rebelled against my father. Because I, I believed stuff, money, possessions is more important than me. And so <clears throat> I decided I was going to hurt him the way he hurt me. I'm in that school in the seventh week and I have a dream. And God the Father brought, was, was there in that cabin and he was dressed the opposite of my earthly father. Because I think my dad, you know, he's Mr. Businessman. He slept in a suit. <laughs> he was spit and polish. And here's, here's God the Father in this cabin with me looking like a middle-aged hippie. <laughs> <clears throat> kind of shoulder length, gray hair, beard, blue jean shirt, blue jeans, and tennis shoes. And I wake up in this cabin, I'm 12 years old, in the dream, and I look into the kitchen where I see him with his back to me preparing breakfast. And <clears throat> my first thought is, I wonder who that is. And as I think that thought, he turns around at the stove and he looks into my eyes and I experience the sheer delight of my father. Yeah. And just by him looking at me, I realize I am number one in his eyes. I realized when I looked into his eyes that he could not love me any more than he already does. That I am the apple of his eye. And what I was experiencing in that dream is what Jesus experienced when the Father spoke over him and said, This is my beloved Son. In him I have great delight. Jesus never, never, you know, veered from that opinion of the Father. Other people thought he was Elijah. They thought he was Beelzebub. They had all kinds of ideas about who Jesus was when he was on earth. But he remained true whether he raised the dead or took a nap. He remained true to the Father's opinion. Yeah. And I realized in that dream, I need to spend my life remaining true to the Father's opinion. That whether I raise the dead or I take a nap, I'm always His beloved Son. In whom He delights. And nothing I can do will change His mind. Hello. Because He's had that opinion of me from before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world, he chose me, he adopted me, he predestined me to be his beloved son. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some things for him. But it's like taking your life and turning it upside down, which is actually right side up. Because it, it's taking your life from I do, therefore I am, to he did, therefore I am. And in this place, where he did, therefore I am, there is freedom. Yeah. There is freedom from other people's opinions. 
mask. When you think about it today, whose opinion are you living under? Whose opinion are you living under? Because if that is a negative opinion, that will limit you. And you may not even be aware of it, as I was not, <laughs> that I was living under the opinion of my earthly father. And that was limiting me from being living under my Abba Father's opinion. So somebody's got to change and it ain't going to be him. Yeah. We have to let go yeah. of any judgment that, that we have made against anyone else. But the, usually the person we've judged the most is right here. And therefore, we're not able to receive the love of the Father because we have an opinion of ourselves that says we're not good enough. Or, you know, we're, we're, we haven't, we're not righteous enough. We're not whatever enough. You're never going to be enough. <laughs> That's the deal. That's why Jesus came. None of us could do it good enough. Only he did it good enough, and I got his report card. I got what his deeds deserved. Righteousness, peace, and joy forever. And he got what my deeds deserved. Crucifixion on a cross. So, <clears throat> I remember when the renewal started in Toronto. And John Arnott, you know, did this great talk on hard to receive. And people would come from all over the world because someone they knew got blasted. <laughs> and they came and they wanted to experience what their friends had. And many of those people would stand on the lines to receive prayer. And they'd be like the oaks of righteousness. <laughs> they just couldn't receive. It, and... and <clears throat> You know, and John did this great talk because he, he talked about, for him it was hard to receive. Having an alcoholic father who you never know, you know, what opinion he's going to have of you today based on what you've done or not done or what he thinks you've not done. And John lived with that. And, you know, our, our personality is formed by the time we're seven apart from the grace of God. That stuff remains granite in our lives. And as, as we're able to forgive and let go of what people have said, how they've treated us, even looked at us, if we're able to let that go, we can then receive. And as I said, usually the most important person we need to forgive is right here. Yeah. Yourself. God has forgiven you for everything in Christ. Jesus doesn't have to die again on the cross. It's once and for all, right? He took all my sin for all my life. And I need to forgive myself as he has forgiven me. And really let go of any judgments I've made against myself. It'd be interesting right now if we could see ourselves clearly how the Father sees us. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, one day, first second in heaven, you're going to be fully known. <laughs> We're going to, that first second in heaven, we are going to not only see Him in the fullness, we're going to see ourselves as He sees us. Yeah. We're going to be fully known. This, and I, I think, you know, our first second in heaven, we're going to be going, what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you see me? That's who you really are? So let's pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And receive everything he wants to do in our lives. You got to let it go. Amen? Amen. Do you love yourself? Yeah. Do you love being you? Yeah. Or do you spend your life comparing yourself and competing with other people? And not feeling good enough? Striving to be number one. And then total depression when you're number two. Yeah. 
See, that's all got to be transformed. Because it's all based in that, that fear of not being good enough. That's the shame-based world that we live in. That's what we'll be talking about tonight. Receiving the Father's love is receiving His honor. Yeah. His opinion. Wow. And it, it's only that way can I actually love Him. Right. With the love that I have received from Him. So Father, we thank You today. As we say, not my will, thy will be done. As we drink the cup that you drank in the Garden of Gethsemane, you said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not, your, not my will, thy will be done. So I just want to ask you today, if, if there's anybody, if they were to come in that door, you'd want to run out that door. Is there anybody from your past that you have not let go? You haven't forgiven? Is there anything in your life today that you haven't forgiven yourself for? Where every time you think about that, there's regret, shame. I wish I would have. I wish I didn't. And so that, that's sort of the skeleton in the closet that the enemy continues to rattle that keeps you from receiving the Father's love. So, <clears throat> is there anybody today you need to let go of? If so, just stand where you are and we're going to pray together. You see, this... this Intimacy with the Father is the pearl of great price. And once you, once you finally realize that, you got to be willing to sell everything to buy it. You got to be willing to let go of every person who sinned against you. Every, every judgment you've made against yourself, I'm forgiving myself today. I'm going to let it go. Wow. Maybe just come on up to the front. Would that be okay? We'll, we'll pray together and then we're going to have the ministry team just pray for you too.